The, the whole area is underexplored, which if you are somebody who's studying computer games and human rights is pretty good for you, because it means you get to do the exploration. Um, I pose a lot of questions in this talk, um, and I give few answers. Again, from your perspective, this is quite good, because anything where there's a question but no hard and fast answer means that you can write at least an essay about it, maybe a paper about it, maybe get a job all about it, who knows. But any unanswered questions are there to be answered. And because there aren't all that many places studying uh, computer games and human rights, you are in a good position to be the ones to, to uh, address those questions. Um, I do, however, in this talk, hope to establish some um, principles which will help you... Um, It'll, do, it, it'll um, remove a lot of the thinking you'd have to do in order uh, beforehand because these are like this is about how far we've got. There are some, some principles which you need to know because um, otherwise it's easy to make a mistake, which is uh, one of the things that the uh, Council of Europe people did um, they, when they uh, produced a document that essentially said um, introduce human rights in computer games in these ways. Oh, and by the way, no one will play computer games as a result. Um, that would be an example of a misguided or overzealous application of laws, because they can do more harm than good. If you've got something and you apply a law, then the law, it might be, say, to protect somebody, but it might make it, it worse if you, than if you don't apply it. And this is something which happens quite a bit or could happen quite a bit in uh, computer games, uh, particularly in the um, area of morality, um, of which human rights is like the, the written form. And um, you should consider all the effects of what you're advocating before you act. Um, here's somebody getting knocked out. Right, so when it comes to games and human rights, the, the, um, the important things to remember are everybody has human rights, even those people who don't play games, those subhumans who don't play games, um, they have rights as well. They, they are humans, they do get rights, human rights. So everybody gets human rights. Games are played by players. The players of the games are human, um, therefore they have human rights. And computer games are designed by designers, who are also human and also have human rights. So there are three areas here where there are people who've got human rights. People who play, people who don't play, and people who design. And many of the issues we'll be coming across will be to do with how they compete. So how the designers' human rights compete with the players, or how the players compete with, compete with the non-players. So those are the areas where, we're, where we'll be looking at, and those are where that you have to get the right balance. Um, now, people have many rights. Not all of them are human rights. For example, they've got consumer rights. So if I buy something and it doesn't work, I can take it back to the shop and complain, and they'll give me a new one. Um, not if it's a baby, obviously, but other things. Um, so th those are rights, but they're not human rights. They're not rights which you have by merely by being a human. Um, human rights are inalienable, which means you can't take them away. So. You've got the rights, you can't say, oh, I, I never believed in that slavery thing myself, I'll happily be a slave, look, let me just sign the contract, I'll be a slave. No, slavery is against human rights, you can't sign it away even if you want to. Um, they're backed by the uh, United Nations 94, 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, although um, these days they talk about the International Bill of Human Rights, which has another couple of things in from 1966 onwards. But the, the, the main one from our point of view is, the, is going to be the, the original one, the, um, international, the um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, and because of this, they apply everywhere. And that means they apply even to people who play computer games. Now, it's easy when you're discussing human rights to slip into other areas of law. For example, fraud maybe it's a well, i'm sure that even here it's a crime um fraud um it's probably not in the city of london but uh but it's not a human rights violation it's just a crime um 
but if you start talking about human rights and then start talking about law, sooner or later you end up talking about laws that aren't human rights, and then you find, find yourself um, just like a regular law. Whereas if, it's, if you're studying games and human rights, you really do need to focus on the human rights aspects because those are the ones which are... Uh, um, in, they, they're the ones that need to be interpreted, but they can't be changed. You can change laws, but you can't change human rights. Um, likewise, there's a confusion between human rights and law-making. So if you treat a human rights convention as part of a, a state, a country's constitution, then you can get confusion because the, the, the country itself has got a constitution and it's, it brings in constitutional law and then the argument doesn't become about human rights, it becomes about how you can, um, how you can alter the contents of the constitution. Um, America's um, lawyers are great at bringing everything back to the constitution, at least their constitution. Um, it's also very easy to stretch human rights um, thinly. Um, if you are uh, hurt emotionally, um, well, one of the uh, things in the Human Rights Universal Declaration of Human Rights is um, you've got a security of person. Um, so if you're hurt, like somebody hits you, well, that's against your human rights. If somebody hurts you emotionally, is that against your human rights? Uh, it made me cry. Well, on the one hand, you could say that's, that is a, um, a violation, but on the other hand, so, okay, so your rabbit died, it made you cry. Well, you know, you get, are you going to sue the rabbit? It's its own fault for dying. We had a, um, a police officer in the UK who was given a dog that could sniff out, I don't know, explosives, I think it was. Um, but she got pregnant, and um, so she kept the dog with her. Uh, and then she got pregnant again straight afterwards, and the police were saying, well, you know, actually we're a bit short of dogs, we're going to need to take your dog and give it to somebody else until you're back at work. And uh, that made her really upset, and she, uh, she took them to court. This was like three days ago, and she won. She, uh, they shouldn't have taken what she regarded as her dog away from her, even though it had been trained at public expense to sniff out public explosives. So it is, at some cases, you'll go with the, oh, it's emotional, and some, uh, that's harm, and other cases you wouldn't. But again, it's all balance. Now, um, this is an important point when it comes to games uh, and human rights. Most games will involve moving tokens around of some kind in some kind of space. So you've got some space, a map or a board or something, and you've got these tokens and you move them around. For example, chess pieces on a chess board, those are tokens that are moving around. Sometimes one of these tokens will be special and it will be uh, represent the player. So in a, in a role-playing game, there will always be one character that is you, the player. That's the whole point of them. The important thing is, the token isn't the player. The token is your character. Sometimes it's called an avatar, um, although strictly speaking that's just a visual appearance, but um, I'll be calling them ca uh, characters. So you have a character in the game which um, you play as in the game, but that character isn't you. So if things happen to the character, they don't happen to you, they only happen to the character. Whether the character has human rights or not, well it doesn't, it's a character, it's, it's humans who have the human rights. We'll come to this a bit later. Um, now, if we're going to talk about games and human rights, having just um, given a very quick overview of human rights, I'm going to give a very quick overview of games. What is a game? Well, um, this is my definition. It's not in any books except, actually probably isn't in any books. Um, play. This is what happens when you freely, as in no one's holding a gun to your head making you do it, knowingly, so that you know you're in a game, you're not walking down the street and somebody says you've lost, hand over the, uh, the winnings. How many, what, what, what do you mean I've lost? Well, you know, if, if you stand on that, particular paving stone, then uh, you're supposed to pay five pounds. You know, it's, it's the game and you stood on it. I wasn't playing. How you were. No, you see, you have to know you're playing a game in order to be able to play it or play anything. So it's where you freely and knowingly bound your behaviour. By that I mean you could do something, but you choose not to do it because you're playing 
it's part of play. So if you're playing chess, yeah, the very first move I could take your king with my queen, but that would be against the rules of chess. When I play chess, I bound my behaviour so that they conform to a set of rules. So I bound my behaviour according to the rules in the hope of gaining some benefit. The benefit is usually to have fun. So that's what play is, and um, games are just play at which you can lose. Other than that, they're pretty much the same as regular play. Computer games are games played on computers. They're not games played using computers or with computers because then you could count iPad Frisbee as a game, a computer game. It's not a computer game. It's, it might be a game, but it's not a computer game. Computer games like digital games. Um, so we've got all, all sorts of games. Computer games are just one particular kind of game that uh, is very interesting because these are ones that are now um, surging through society, whereas in the past games weren't, um, unless you count football and things like that, which of course um, are games and have been for dec um, centuries. This is a picture of two bear cubs fighting. Pretty good. The one on the left there is a bit taller, but the one on the right's like got the moves. Um, right, so the game paradox. Um, the reason that people play is because they think they're going to get a benefit. Usually they think they're going to have fun. But there might be other reasons. So you might play a game, not because the game's fun, but because you might learn something at the end of it. Um, having played the game Risk for many, many years, what I learned was that my father and brother were better at it than me. Um, but I can tell you where Kamchatka is. Um, hmm, what I just ate? I'm probably not alive anymore. Um, so you people play games for some benefit. It might be to keep the, ch the children quiet, it might be to spend some time, it might be because it's fun, that's the usual reason. Um, now to gain this benefit, they, they temporarily give up some freedom to act. In other words, they follow the rules. So you want to play a game, the game's going to be fun, but only if everybody follows the rules. If, if people aren't following the rules, you haven't got a game. Now, paradoxically, if everybody restricts their behaviour in order to fit the rules so that they conform to the rules, then that opens up new actions that were unavailable before. Because if the other players are also um, bounding their behaviour by the rules, you can do things which previously you might, might have been able to do, but they wouldn't have been significant, like kicking a ball into a net. That's only significant if you're all playing by the rules and you know that's really important. Or it might have been something which you just couldn't have done before, um, which we'll come to in the next couple of slides. Um, game scholars call the space in which players um, are bounding their actions the magic circle. So if we're all trying to follow the rules and the rules are restricting our behaviour in some way, that space in which they re restrict our behaviour is the magic circle. Sometimes it's a physical space, like an ice hockey rink where you're allowed to hit people with sticks, but outside it's bad, it's frowned upon, but inside, yeah, everybody's expecting it. But, some, but um, the magic circle itself is actually uh, like a, um, an intellectual thing. It's, it, it's, um, it's not a physical space, it's um, a space of, um, of agreement, if you like. The context that it provides the magic circle, um, gives what psychologists call a frame. A frame uh, is, is a, a set of permissions to do things that normally you perhaps wouldn't. Uh, an example here is a game called Dark Room Sex Game. Uh, have you heard of Dark Room Sex Game? It's a game for the Wii with no graphics. So you've, two people have got Wii handsets. And so you go like that, one, one goes like that, and it goes... Ah, and the other person goes like, and he goes, ah, 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 and then and, until the finally you get together and ah, and then, and then you win. Now, of course, um, if I was to walk down the street and say what I've just said just now in the street, people would probably think, oh, he's English, doesn't matter. But but if I was to do it in a, in a, like in central London, well, they'd probably think, oh, crazy person, keep away. But that's the kind of thing you could get arrested for. Um, Darkroom Sex Game was made to show that people can go beyond their regular, their regular um, boundaries. 
So if you get a, if I go, uh, 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 that's fine. But what if I go, uh, and then the, uh, the other player goes, uh, as well. I say, oh, two guys, okay. So I'm straight and you're probably straight. So, well, let's just do it anyway. And they play the game and it's the same game. Ha, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you've stepped over a boundary, but because you've got the protection of the, the magic circle and everyone knows you're playing a game and you do it, then it's fine. But you can go a bit too far. So let's say I go, uh, and you go, nay. Okay. <laughs> well, that's kind of, kind of, kind of horse thing. Well, uh, uh, actually, this is feeling a little bit uncomfortable now. I'm breaking some taboos that I perhaps don't want to, but hey, I could win money, so I'll keep playing. Um, and people in the audience might be thinking, ah, that's, uh, that's not really very good, this. Um, yeah. They are protected by this magic circle, but I don't like the, the people who wrote the game. And then finally, if you go, if you were to do something like you just, uh, and then the people go, Mama. <laughs> well, you know, no one's going to go it again, are they? They go, okay, that's kind of too far. So although you break, you can break some, um, some contexts by playing games, there are limits. There are some contexts which you can't break because um, it gives you permission to do it, but there are permissions that um, will affect the rest of the world. Um, we don't want child molesters playing games like this. And there will be permissions which affect you, the player. It might be okay to have one with, I mean, there'll still be some people who wouldn't play the gay version, for example, um, for religious reasons or um, I'm really gay and don't want people to know reasons. Um, many um, leisure activities involve frames. It's not just games. So actors on a stage can use language which would get them arrested if they said it in the street. They can say um, sexist and racist things which in the streets would, they would be arrested for um, causing, uh, provoking uh, riots or something. But on, a, on, on context, in a stage, they can use this language and they're fine because everybody knows that they're just pretending. And so it is with games. If everyone knows you're just pretending, then you get this protection. Um, now, rationally, the magic circle that I've been describing doesn't actually exist. It's not a physical thing. But players want it to exist so much that they will will themselves to ignore it. So when you're playing a game, and yeah, in the game I'm, a, I'm, I'm the, the king of Narnia or something, um, I know I'm not really, but I will myself to believe it. In the same way as when I'm reading a book, I will myself to believe that Sam wouldn't have just pushed Frodo into the crack of doom. I would have done in Lord of the Rings. Um, so I have to will myself to believe that what's in the book is true. And it's this willed suspension of disbelief for books. It's similar to that for games. Um, yes, but you calls it half real, where there's some kind of um, narrative that you choose to believe in order to make the game playable. Um, players will in tr um, tolerate some degree of reality intruding into their game. But if there's too much, then the magic circle will break. So with the um, darkroom sex game, yeah, some of it's all right, but if there's too much reality, it shocks them out of it. They, you can also shock them out of it if something unexpected happens. So you're playing a game and something happens which you were not expecting. That I didn't think I was playing that kind of game. That Then suddenly you'll stop playing as well. The magic circle's broken. Um, now before I, uh, that's sort of like an overview of games using some terms I'll come back to later. Um, I'll, I'll need to use later. Um, before I start discussing human rights um, and games, I'll mention that there isn't a human right to play. So nobody has a right to play. There are human rights which you could interpret as being a right to play. Um, they've got a right to self-expression, which you can interpret as a right to play, perhaps. But it really depends how you're playing, what you're playing. And the thing is, we, we say these are human rights, but it's not just humans who play. Animals play. That picture of those bears that I showed you, they weren't actually fighting. They were playing at fighting. And this is where serious games are coming from. They're coming from, they looked. Play is a way of learning. Those bears were fighting so that when they needed to fight, they knew the moves that, they, that would be necessary because they've been playing at fighting. So games... 
you can't say that playing games is a human right because it's played by people, by entities that aren't humans as well as by humans. It's played by, by animals, higher order animals. So there is that, um, that uh, um, issue there. And if uh, you say, well, well, there is a right to play and bears have a right to play, well, perhaps bears have a, a right to some of the other human rights and human rights aren't human rights at all. They're just kind of smart animals' rights. Um, this is Okinawa, um, May the 1st, 1945. There's a Japanese sniper somewhere up in this church, I think around there. Um, and these are American soldiers who are there. Um, the Japanese sniper is thinking they'll, they'll never shoot at me because I'm in a church. And the Americans are saying, why is that guy in a church? Doesn't he know we're going to destroy it when we shoot at him? Um, anyway, so... Human rights and games. Uh, human rights all sounds very grand and worthy, but which human rights? Um, computer games may raise more questions about some human rights than they do about others. Typically the ones that they raise more questions about are the ones which aren't going to get headlines in national newspapers. Likewise, talking about computer games, well that makes it all cool because computer games are cool, um, but which computer games? Some computer games raise more human rights issues than other computer games. Um, so when it comes to human rights, um, it's like you can pay, um, place them in tiers. Uh, this is a wedding cake, so it's got all these different tiers. And this is the number of games. So there's lots of games that have got... And this is the number of human rights issues. So lots of games have got a few human rights issues. Um, a, a smaller number have a, a lot more. A smaller number have all these, till you get to the very top where a much smaller number have all those human rights issues. So each higher tier has fewer games than the one before it, because it's narrower, but it has the same issues of human rights as the lower ones, plus some new ones that the lower ones didn't have. Now I'm going to go through these tiers here. Um, the, the, the bottom tier um, concerns the rights of non-players. So, can I play games if it offends you that I play them? Then you, above that you've got single player games. Um, is it okay to kill beggars in a game for experience points? They're not real beggars. Multiplayer games. What if I always shoot the black characters first? Is that breaking someone's human rights? Massively multiplayer games. Um, can I campaign for a real political party? Can I go into Guild Wars 2 and uh, campaign for a real political party? Can I say things about Mitt Romney, knowing that no players of Mitt Rom no, no one who supports Mitt Romney will be in Guild Wars 2? And then there's some weird futuristic possibilities. Um, I only have a, like a slide on this. Um, if non-player characters are intelligent, can I switch off the game? because then I'm killing 200 million um, intelligent entities. Right, so, um, oh, here's a scene from The Sims. Somebody's built this little, I don't know if you can see it, someone's built this little room like this with no doors in it, and they put a wife in and a husband in it, um, and they've given the guy a whole load of things to uh, eat and drink, which he has done, but there's no toilet, there's nothing there. Um, later, he goes mad, sets the house on fire, and his wife survives the blaze by standing in his wee. Uh, somebody's uh, really gone to a lot of thought to torment those sims. Um, right, so non-player rights. The most direct way that games affect non-players concerns consent. Um, for example, here's a regular game that you could play. A computer generates a secret random word for you and it generates another one for me. So your random word might be something like house and uh, my secret random word might be something like tree. Uh, and then we have to have a conversation. I'm going to try and get you to say house and you're going to try and get me to say tree. And whoever says it first, then the person whose word that is wins. So if I say tree, you win. No, that's not bad. That's not a bad game. That's fine. You could play that. Example game two, it's the same game, but we try and get random people out in the street to say the words. 
people who aren't playing the game. So we just go up to um, your mother and try and get your mother to say some word. And your mother's thinking, what's going on here? What, what are they talking about? Until eventually she says tree or house and then the game over. So in the first one, that's not any issue. The second one, though, that doesn't seem right, that you should be able to go and do that kind of thing. It's like the joke, um, I used to go and play chess in the park with the old men there, but it's so hard to get 32 of them and they keep wandering off. Um, so the, the people you're using as pawns, the non-player characters who you're using as part of your game, um, are going to be annoyed. Um, is it breaching their human rights? Um, what if instead of speaking to them, you punched them? First person to knock out a stranger in the street wins. Hey, it's okay, I'm playing a game. If it works, hey, it's okay, I'm playing a game in the first case. Should it work in the second case? Or is physical violence somehow um, brings more uh, to the table than merely uh, wasting someone's time? Um, if you say we're just playing a game, then that can mean that you're given, um, you're allowed to break some human rights things if both people consent. Boxing, okay, that guy getting his face knocked off that I showed to start with, he'd consented to be hit in the face um, by the other guy, so that's fine. But if you hit people, that's breaking their human rights. People aren't allowed to sign away their human rights. That's part of it. So this guy has signed away his human rights. He is being hit, and yet no police officer is coming in to say, excuse me, that's an assault. You're going to prison. So it looks as if human rights can sometimes be signed away when it comes to games, which is a little weird because it can't be signed away for anything else. Without consent, it fails. So if, 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 um, if I got into a ring and I was expecting it to be a wrestling match and then somebody punched me and said, ha, it was a boxing match, well, they are going to jail. Um, now, the thing is that boxing is particularly interesting because they're giving up this human right. Um, Article 3 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says security of person. You have a right not to be beaten up. Human rights law would annul any contract that let you do that. So is it a general principle that games can override human rights? Um, shouldn't non-players be able to protect players of games from themselves. So we allow boxing. What about Russian roulette? That's a game. People play it. They consent to it. Yeah, I'll play a game of Russian roulette. And we sit down there and one of us loses for eternity. But if people have agreed to it, shouldn't they be allowed to do it? And and if they aren't allowed to do it, then why are they allowed to do boxing? You can get brain damage in boxing. Plenty of boxers do. So where's the human rights dr line drawn here? Is it always possible, if you're playing a game with consent, to step over the line of human rights and not have anybody from the outside coming in? This is a pope. Poor guy. He gets to be pope but he has the most evil face. He can't help it. It's just, oh, man. It just, uh, oh, well, at least there are some jobs where you don't have to look good on camera to get them. You just have to be male. Right, um, collateral damage. What if my game playing offends you? So I'm not playing and tricking you into doing anything. I'm not hurting anybody. But the mere fact I'm playing a game offends you. This is a big seller in um, 2005 in America. Deer Hunter 2005. So you, it's, you get a, a gun, uh, not a real gun, it's just a computer gun. You line it up and then you see all the things and then bang and then, ha, I got it. You shot a deer. And you get points for that and so on. And then you buy bigger and better guns and shoot bigger and better and more elusive animals or whatever. 
That game never made it to the UK um, because it involves killing animals. And that's regarded as being in bad taste and um, non-players can get very upset. So a game in which you're shooting innocent, happy little animals will, can really upset some people who don't play the game, even though no real animals are hurt. If that game had been launched in the UK, there would have been people standing outside the shops in 2005 demanding it would be removed from the shelves. Now they have to stand outside the internet demanding it be removed from the shelves. Um, of course, this is games um, shooting animals, but in the UK it's fine to have games that shoot people. Now, people can care less about that, but it's shooting animals that's the problem, which is a bit of a double standard. Uh, no one's going well fewer people are going to complain about a game in which you're shooting you're a sniper shooting other player uh, other characters even if they're non-player characters than if you were a sniper shooting deer wandering around in a forest but should the worries of these other people mean that i'm not allowed to play the game because i'm offending them um there will be people who will be genuinely distressed what about other games um, where player characters mock your religion? Um, well, in, in many cases, it depends on the religion. If you mock Islam, you're probably going to get a lot more trouble than if you mock Christianity. Certainly a lot more trouble than if you mock um, Zeus uh, out of ancient Greece. Um, what about games that uh, involve kicking children or raping women? There are games in um, Japan which you can buy and play a guy who stalks random women and rapes them. They don't sell very well in the West, but you, they sell in Japan. What about games that show realistic gore that's so bad that it makes you want to throw up? You know, you actually see you know, bits of brains and stuff. Um, knowing that there is this stuff out there, is that something that if would offend enough people that the game should be banned, even though they're not playing the game? Now, note here, although the real reason people don't like these things is because it's got some kind of an ooh factor, ew, ew, that's not what they say. They always try and come up with some more um, rational reason for it. Um, for example, um, we banned fox hunting in Britain. Uh, the thing about fox hunting is that some people like hunting foxes and some people don't like the fact that other people like hunting foxes. But the, um, the debate was never about, I don't like you hunting foxes. It was always about, you're ruining the countryside or your dogs are ruining the countryside or our dogs will all be put down and, and you'll be killing the dogs if you don't let people us go hunting. It was never described in terms of um, we don't like you getting pleasure from hurting animals. And this is how this kind of debate usually goes. So if somebody doesn't like the fact you're playing a game, they're not going to say I don't like that game because you're sick. They're going to say I don't like that game because, well, um, usually it's because um, games are somehow different to all the other media. So if you don't like um, the thought of somebody getting raped, well, there are plenty of movies where people get raped. Now, are you saying you shouldn't be allowed to make a movie in which somebody gets raped? Or a book in which somebody gets raped? In which case, why uh, are you applying the same logic to games? And so they have to say, well, games are different to movies and books and interpretive dance and everything else because they're interactive. People learn things from them. This is the usual explanation. But in general, if I write a book that mocks somebody's religion, yeah, that's going to offend people, but I still am allowed to write it. And other people can protest, but I can still do it. If I write a game that does it, surely the same logic should apply. But not if games are somehow different because they, they've got this interactivity. Um, so if I play games in which 
I witness human rights abuses, and maybe not, I don't actually do them, I don't actually go out there and abuse someone's human rights, but in the game somebody else does, is that acceptable or should that game somehow be banned? Because it's not quite interactive, is it? I'm just watching it like it was a cutscene or something. Um, much of this, um, this view of games as being um, more in need of, uh, not so much censorship, but um, uh, of, um, more likely to cause uh, pain to sensitive people. Um, it comes from ignorance, because the people who um, are worried about it tend not to play many games. Um, and then there is the question of how many games actually show human rights abuses. And as it happens, we know the answer. Because there's a, an organisation based in Switzerland called Trial, Track Impunity Always, a nice attempt to retrofit a, uh, an acronym to English there, Switzerland. Um, they looked at uh, 20 first-person shooters covering contemporary combat. So these are 20 games, first-person shooters, where you're going around shooting other people, set in a modern era, not set like World War II and earlier, set since the Universal Declaration of Human Rights came out. So 1948 onwards. Um, so all these games, 20 of these first-person shooters, are set in a period when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights should apply. Um, the author, Frida Castillo, um, judged the, uh, the content of the game against two sets of um, international law, um, human rights law and humanitarian law. Um, the difference is human rights law is mainly about war, humanitarian law is mainly about peace, but they're pretty much the same general um, principles. Some of the games scored well, some of them didn't. The commonest violations of um, human rights or humanitarian law were principles of distinction and proportionality. This means you shouldn't destroy civilian property for non-military reasons. So if you're in a game and you're in a tank, you think, I wonder how, I wonder how good this tank is. I'll just knock over that barn. Boom, up goes the barn. Well, in real life, you're not allowed to do that. You just wantonly destroyed somebody's barn. Somebody who, and completely innocent, uh, they're thinking, my cows, what, what, what have you done to my cows? Um, so that's one thing that the uh, games um, did that. The other thing that they often did was torture and cruel or inhuman or degrading behaviour. So the game um, would allow you to um, capture somebody and then torture them to get information out of them. Something like that. Um, now, the way that this report was written, it assumed that any um, depiction of international human humanitarian or human rights laws was a bad thing. So if I show torture in the game, that is a bad thing. But the problem with this is it, understand, it, it, it doesn't understand games as being works of art. Games are actually created for a reason. They're not a ref necessarily a reflection of reality. They've been created because the game designer is wanting to say something. Um, for example, you might be playing a game and there's torture, and the torture's been done by the bad guys, so you know they're the bad guys, because good guys don't do torture. So if you're in a game and you see some guys torturing somebody, you think, OK, bad guys. And now you've got an incentive to try and rescue the prisoner and, or whatever. But from the point of view of does it show um, human rights abuses or not, well, it shows it, so it's a bad thing. But actually, it's a good thing because it's showing, it, it's not making you abuse the human rights, it's showing the bad guys abusing them. That's how you know they're bad. You can learn torture is bad this way. If you didn't know beforehand, because you're ignorant, like they, everybody seems to think games players are, but they're not. They're, in general, games players are quite well informed. Um, if, you could, if you played a game and all the bad guys were always torturing people and the good guys never were, you could actually learn from playing the game that torture was bad, which must be a, a good thing for people to learn. So 
it's all right to rate games or whatever by their content, but it's always to do with the context. Um, Non-player interest in human rights, which is what I've just been covered, um, primarily concerns the use of non-player characters of non as game tokens, protecting players from being complicit in their own human rights abuses, so stopping people from playing Russian roulette, upsetting non-players, for example, by glorifying rape or murder or something else, uh, and by planting seeds in the minds of players that human rights abuses can be acceptable. Although, that still goes on in television. You can watch the first series of 24, and the guy goes all out and tortures there. Remarkably, it works, which is a bit strange, because torture normally doesn't. So, you, but, but that would be one of the reasons where human rights violations and games could come into play. Now, this last point brings us up to the next tier, um, which is single-player games. So we've looked at games versus non-players, now we're looking at what things single-players bring in. In a single-player game, you're the player. You can't directly abuse anybody else's human rights because you're playing by yourself. You can do it indirectly because you've got that whole layer below that we've just talked about, but you can't do it directly. Um, but you can do things which would be if they happened in real life, violations. Now notice there's a frame difference here. In the game, if it happens in the game and in real life, those are two different things. So in the game, it's, um, I'm doing this thing. If, if I did it in real life, then it would be a violation. But they don't all have the same um, mass. They're not all, they don't all have the same impact on people. Um, here's a, a list of them, kind of in order of um, how easy it is to excuse them. So things you see happen, but you can't prevent. So you go into a game, you see torture happening, you can't prevent that, it's a cut scene. There's, you, you can hardly say, well, that's, I'm um, doing anything bad there. There are things you can do that the game punishes you for having done. For example, some of those first-person shooters they looked at in the trial report would give you a mission failure if you fired on a church. They'd also give you a mission failure if you put a sniper in a church. Now, the, uh, that picture I showed you from May 1945 of a sniper in a church, that was before the legislation came out. But nowadays, if there's a sniper in a church, then American soldiers will not try and shoot the church to pieces in order to kill the sniper. They may try and shoot the sniper with them um, their own sniper, but they're not going to destroy the whole church because then it would be mission fail for them um, in real life. Human, humanitarian law stops that. Um, there are things you can do that are bad that the game lets you do. So The Sims, which probably isn't really actually a game, it is actually a, more of a simulation, but that lets you imprison Sims. You can do things like Put, give them the swimming pool, wait till they get into the swimming pool, remove the ladder, they can't get out of the swimming pool, eventually they're going to go to sleep and drown. Ha 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 ha. You've tortured the Sims. That's torture. The game's not making you doing it, but it's allowing you to do it. It's not giving the Sims superpowers to enable them to escape from their deaths that you've arranged for them. So by letting people play the Sims, are you saying, ah, oh, this is kind of encouraging people to be... Uh, um, tormenting things. First they start with the sims, before you know it they'll be doing it to kittens. Then there are things that the game rewards you for doing. So you might get experience points for shooting passers-by. So these are ordinary people down the street doing nothing wrong in the game and you shoot them because you can. And you get experience points because obviously um, by shooting somebody you've learned a little better of how to shoot and kill so the fact that they're innocent makes no difference. You are a better shot having shot them. So you get experience points. So the game's kind of encouraging you to shoot people. It might not be requiring you to shoot them, but it's certainly encouraging you to do it. And then the final example is where it does actually require you to do something unpleasant. Um, Oblivion, which was the uh, previous Elder Scrolls thing before Skyrim. Um, in that game, 
it was almost unavoidable that you would get turned into a vampire if you played it long enough. And when you had turned into a vampire, you had to go and feast on humans, beggars in the streets at night. You had to go and suck their blood. Uh, and you had little choice to do that. That wasn't, um, you know, that was, you were going to have to do it. And that's not a very good thing at all. Now, of all those things I've just given, only that last one, is th that's the only one where you might think that the player's own human rights are being abused. Because if you play a game and you're not expecting to have to go sucking the bloods of innocent beggars, and then suddenly you find out that you are, well, that's not right. You've been misled. Um, I don't personally want to have to do things in a game that disturb me. Therefore, I shouldn't have to do that. And if they tell me it's going to happen, I won't buy the game. And this brings us to the relationship between players and designers. Because, no, I don't actually have to do bad things because I don't have to play the game at all. So the game's asking me to do these bad things. I can just stop playing. Other people who don't think they're bad could keep playing. The difference is that if I'd known in advance, maybe I wouldn't have played. Um, we'll come back to that a bit later. Now, part of the a definition of a game is that players play freely. So if you don't like it, you stop playing. But what if a game were designed to remove that freedom? What if, they what if I created a game that was addictive, stopped you from leaving because you had to keep coming back? It is possible to create games that are psychologically addictive. Um, gambling machines do this, they're slot machines. That's all about giving people variable rewards, um, variable period rewards, so that people will keep coming back and just as they're about to leave they win something so they keep coming and, and so on. And it's all figured out, um, all mathematically worked out and uh, it works. Um, gamification which is um, a big thing at the moment, using games techniques for non-games purposes. A lot of that is to do with tricking people into doing things that they don't want to do. Getting them hooked on buying shoes online or whatever. So if you uh, make someone addicted to your game, then the argument, well, they can always stop playing, doesn't work. Because they can't stop playing because you've addicted them. So addicting people to games, again, it doesn't look like it's a good thing. Um, oh, this is Colditz Castle in Saxony. I'm a prisoner of war camp in World War II. All the prisoners, the Allied prisoners who kept escaping and getting captured, they were all rounded up, all the officers, that's why it's off flag. Um, they were all captured and put into the same camp on the basis that if we put all the bad eggs in one basket, they won't contaminate anyone else and it'll be easier to control them. Um, there were uh, 130 escape attempts, of which 36 made it, made it home, 36 home runs. This is the highest of all the prison camps. So that was a pretty bad mistake there by the Nazis. They put everybody in the same camp and got more escapes from there than they would have done if they'd left them where they were, because they created this, um, th this place full of people with ideas for how to escape from prisoner of war camps. Anyway, um, game design is an art form. Um, it allows players to present political views through gameplay and fiction. Um, you may not believe this, but it's true. When you play a game, there are political views being made to you, if the game's not just an abstract game. For example, all elves in computer games are nature-loving aesthetes. You know, they're haughty. They shoot arrows, they hug trees. Um, all dwarfs are beer-drinking boors. They dance around, they've always got ale in their hands, they carry axes, they speak with Scottish accents. Um, now, okay, that looks all right, but if you think about it, this is endorsing a view that stereotyping people by race is just fine. It's natural and justified. So if you're playing a game and it's got elves and they all behave one way, and it's got dwarfs and they all behave one way, you think, okay, that's fine. If it had, instead of that it had had, like, I don't know, Arabs and Jews, 
then you might have thought, well, this is a bit much. It's like saying that all the Arabs are stereotypical Arabs. I don't know. Well, I'm not going to say anything because I don't want to get sued. And all the uh, Jews are stereotypical Jews. You know, I'm sure that there are stereotypes for both these nationalities, these ethnic backgrounds in, um, in Sweden as there are in England. And that's unacceptable. So why is it acceptable to have it for elves and dwarfs? It's kind of saying that, oh, it's, um, it's th these people, they all live together, but they never intermix, do they? They always keep separate. They've all got, you know, the, there's, no ha pe there's nothing that's got an elf father and a dwarf mother. Um, they're always, and that's a political point. And yet people play these games the whole time, they don't notice it. Now, that's not a human rights violation, depicting racism, um, or, or making a political point about it, it isn't human rights. But it is an assault on its principles. It's try, it's, and and it, uh, through the art of games, you can make an argument which the players don't recognise as an argument, but kind of seeps into their consciousness. It makes assumptions which the players accept as part of the game and then take with them into the outside world. Some of those assumptions could be human rights violations. For example, torture is acceptable. Um, now that previous example showed a tacit endorsement of discrimination, but it can be more open. Here's an actual example of real discrimination in a real game. Um, it was in A Tale in the Desert, which is an MMO, there was a guy called the Trader Malachi and he had some pretty good stuff but he would only trade with male characters. Female characters came up to him, he was rude to them, said I don't treat, you know, he treated them as if they were inferior, they had no use for his goods, why don't they go back home cooking, all this sort of stuff. Now, okay, in the context of the game he was a racist character. They were actually planning to have a female trader come along and do the opposite later on. But this, this blew up before that could happen. So, is that sexist? Well, on the one hand, in the context of the game it is, but in real life is it sexist? See, most female players will play female characters, but most female characters are played by men, because men outnumber women. So, in general, about 95% of women, their main character will be female. About 40% of men, their main character will be female. And if men outnumber women 10 to 1, that means when you see a female character, it's more likely to be male, played by a male. So, are you, so, can you say this is sexist because it's somehow affecting women more like at a 95% rate than men? Or, but in absolute terms, more men were affected. And yet... Um, it, it, does that make it an, um, and does that excuse it? Does that mean it's not an abuse of human rights, or, or does it make it an abuse nevertheless? It's, it's, uh, it's quite a tricky thing, because it's very hard to separate the gender of the character and the gender of the player. My elder daughter always plays male characters in MMOs, um, because that way people don't hit on her. She says, <laughs> and there's. That's never. That, that's not the case, really. But uh, no. right. Um, in some cases, um, human rights abuses appear because they reflect reality, or at least the reality at the time the game was set. So, medieval two total war has no female generals. So this is set in the medieval period. Your character has a child. It, if it's male, it can become a general. If it's female, it can never become a general. But it can get married off to form an alliance with somebody. So, is that sexist? Today's world, yes it is. It is a human rights violation. There's probably something in there about opportunity, so yes, it probably would be. But because it's set in the old days, when this thing was like this, it's not. Another example. If you play Football Manager 2012 or any of those FIFA games, you will notice that all the characters, all the players there, are male. Well, that's sexist, but it's reflecting real life. Because in real life, it, um, men ha have more um, physical presence than females, so they don't mix the teams um, once 
uh, from about 12 onwards, because it doesn't matter how good you are. There's, a, there's an England um, women's um, winger called uh, Rachel Yankee. And they said, why don't you try to play for a male team? And she's, uh, because you're good enough. And she said, yeah, I'm good enough, but a 16-year-old boy can stop me because they've just got the upper body strength and you can't get past them. So, so they have to separate things because in real life there are differences between uh, men and women. So sometimes the game reflects sexism in real life. Sometimes they f um, reflect sexism in, gen in, um, in nature. Um, and sometimes they, um, they're doing it for other reasons. Um, for example, um, Dragon Age Origins has some sexism in it to make a point. Um, all the priests in Dragon Age Origins are female, which means if you're a male character, you think, well, that's a bit unfair. All these characters are, all the priests are female. But then in real life, people might think, hold on, in this religion, all the priests are male. So that's kind of unfair. So it's giving them a cause, it's giving male players a cause to sense how female people might feel in real life in some religions. So that would be a, real, a, a reason to put it in, to make a point, a political point about the real world. It might not be noticed by many players, but it might be noticed by some. Um, as Dark Age Origins shows, game designers can be quite liberal. Um, and sometimes they'll take opposite extremes to, um, in order to promote equality. For example, it's very common in role-playing games for gender to be cosmetic, absolutely cosmetic. The only difference between male and female characters is that one uses one character model, the other uses another character model. Um, so women are as strong as men, plate armour fits you no matter what size you are, Everything, you know, men and women are just the same. So there's no difference between them. Now, that's okay, but imagine a game that was set where um, if you got, um, where you could have children. So your characters, um, when they got old, you, they died and then you played one of your children's characters. That means that your characters would have, somebody's going to have to have babies. Are you going to say, men and women are identical except that women can have babies and men can't? In which case, they're not identical, are they? Or are you going to say they're identical in which, and, and men can have babies as well as women? In which case, what, what, what's the meaning of gender? I mean, the whole point of females, the difference between female and men is that women have got wombs, you know, wombed man. So they can have babies and men can't. So there is a point where you can't make things identical without saying, okay, we've basically just got one gender. So if you push these things too far, you get these problems. So although it's a, almost a given in today's RPGs that female characters are going to be just as good as male characters in every aspect, if you introduce the concept of something which defines the difference, can they have babies, then you run up against the wall. And many RP, well, you, you find very few RPGs where you can have babies. Um, now, is this idealism a human rights violation? Like saying these two genders are both the same, is that actually abusing um, human rights? Because it is stripping someone's of their, someone of their individuality. If 95% of women will play a, a female character, to them, being female is somehow important. If only 60% of men play a male character, being a male isn't as strong a part of their identity to men as it is for women, you could argue. Therefore, um, if we make everything the same, you know, men, and, men and women the same, are, are we somehow attacking someone's sense of, of identity? Um, and it can be um, very annoying to players when it's inauthentic. For example, there was a game called The Guild, and they had a pope in there um, the Pope could be female. Um, it was a Swedish game, so I guess that makes sense in Sweden because you've got like um, female bishops and things. But um, the Roman Catholic Church is a little more uh, picky about who it has and tends to want to rule out 50% of the population. So if you're playing this game set in the medieval times and you can have a female Pope, 
because the game designers have decided they're, they're liberal and they want it, well, that can feel bad to the players. They can think, well, you know, you're making some political point here, but actually, no way. I mean, there's never been a female pope. Um, you can't argue that, uh, well, there was once a female general called Joan of Arc, so we can have as many female generals as we want. There's never been female popes, not unless there's been some very good acting. So even if you've got a pope, like the one I showed, they're, they're going to be male. Is, um, if you try and strip away someone's, um, if you say that genders are equal and um, Roman Catholics believe that they aren't, are you somehow offending them in a way that um, attacks their sense of identity? Another thing that games often do is gloss over awkward truths. Pirate games, set in the Caribbean, everybody likes those, you know, you go out swashbuckling and everything, you know, looting ships and so on. Very few of them show slaves. And yet slaves is one of the biggest trades in the Caribbean. They picked up um, slaves from Africa, took them to the Caribbean. From the Caribbean they picked up the raw materials, uh, tobacco and stuff, and they shipped those back to Europe. If, you if everything you learned about pirates was from one of those games, you would know the names of pirates, you might know what their flags looked like, you would know where Vera Cruz was on the uh, um, coast, you'd know where the islands were, St. Kitts, Nevis, but you wouldn't know that there were slaves, even though that was a major importance. Um, in single-player games, you can give players a switch to let them do decide for themselves. You could actually have a liberal or conservative switch. So the liberal switch switches off things like slaves, um, uh, enables things like female popes, and the conservative switch says you don't get the female popes and you do get the slaves. You know, how, how authentic do you want it? So you could do that in a single player game. Not many of them do that, but you could. But in a multiplayer game, see how I've snuck to the next level here, um, they bring a whole new dimension to it, which is other players, because you can't have a f if I'm playing a game with you and I don't want female popes and you do, well, we can't play because that's incompatible. Um, players in single-player games can directly abuse non-player characters, but they can't abuse other real people directly. But players in multiplayer games can abuse the human rights of other real people. Um, you need to remember here that there's a distinction between player and character, so they're actually abusing the character, but through there, somehow affecting the player. Um, here's some examples. When players get along with one another, they will join clans or guilds or whatever they're called in the latest thing. You know, they're sometimes they're fellowships, uh, sometimes they're um, cabals. Um, the, uh, the entrance criteria of a player-run guild can be openly discriminatory. So there are guilds that will say, no, no women are allowed in here. We only allow men in our guild. Because women are always, they come into the guilds and they always cause grief. So we always cause drama, we don't want any women. And they can say that, and they do. And so they only allow men in. Some of the men might be playing female characters, but they're actually men in real life which is, you know, it doesn't make sense in the game context because in the game context, every player is the, every character is the character, is, is a, is a, the gen, has a gender, which the game doesn't know about the real gender, but they're asking for real gender. Sometimes they'll ask for more specific, so homosexual men only. This is a guild for men who are gay or bi. We don't want any straight men in here. You don't understand our culture. You're just going to come in here and bully us. Um, so stay out. Now, both of these are discriminatory. Should you ban them? Um, Blizzard tried to ban um, a guild that only accepted gay people, not men. It accepted men and women. So, um, But it, you, it wouldn't let you in if you were straight. And it banned that on the grounds that it was discriminatory, uh, on the grounds that if they hadn't done that, then people could have created guilds which banned you for being gay. Um, but there was such an outcry that they had to, uh, had to let people in. Uh, 
and yet within the context of the game, there's no, there's no concept of straight or gay. The characters never, you know, they're asexual. They never do anything like kissing other characters or things. So players can be very, they, they can abuse human rights themselves. They don't need the game's help. Could a game ban black characters? Not black players. Hey, if you want to play a white guy, that's fine. Uh, we don't care. We're only banning black characters. Would that be racist? Does the context matter? So if you're creating a, a guild of uh, medieval Vikings, well, they all uh, don't know that there'd be many black medieval Vikings. Um, so probably they would have uh, fiction on the, you know, history on their side. But would that be allowed or not allowed? Should it be allowed or not allowed? Again, these are questions which haven't got an answer yet. No one's gone to the, any courts of human rights saying, um, I'm black in real life, I want to join this guild and um, I want to create a black character and they wouldn't let me. That's um, a, a, a form of discrimination that's abusing my human rights. No one's done that yet, but they might. And then they, when they do, they'll be looking around for people who've written on the subject. Um, most online games are facilitated facilitated by operating companies, so companies like Microsoft and Blizzard and Valve and Sony and so on. So these are the people who operate the games. Now, can those players publicly reveal which player is behind which character? So you're playing a game and you've got this character in the game and nobody knows it's you. Can the company say, it's you? Privacy is a human right. It's um, Article 12 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Is it a privacy violation to, be, to reveal the names of people who are playing characters? An American politician, like last week, um, was revealed to be a player of an orc in World of Warcraft. She was, she was um, like a senator or something like that. Or a, um, and there was this outcry. You know, that she goes in there and she pretends to be an orc and she kills humans and so on. Well, yeah, she doesn't actually kill them, though, does she? It's like a pretend thing. Now, re somebody revealed that she played that game because she didn't go along and post on her website, cool, I've just killed all these humans. Somebody revealed that. Was that a revealing, breaking her privacy, or was it uh, just a fact? It's not breaking privacy, it's just revealing a truth about the world. Blizzard, in 2010 listed it, um, they wanted people to use their blizzard.net which meant they had to use real identities so they revealed the real identities behind their characters um, of anybody who'd been blizzard.net and immediately ran into a storm of trouble because people didn't want other people knowing that they played female characters and they weren't female in real life but all their guildmates thought they were. Um, so they reversed their decision after a few days. But nevertheless, should they have um, st stood firm? Nothing here is clear cut. For example, if you're told up front when you start to play a game that your, your character names will be revealed to everybody associated with your real names, that might be okay. It's only if you've not been told that and reveal it. If you know when you sign up that it's going to be revealed, then maybe that's okay. What if some feature requires disclosure? So EVE Online has this thing, the Stellar Management Committee, um, which is where players join up to, they join this committee which um, it, um, speaks to Blizzard about um, games issues. And there's an elections and all sorts. But to be elected, you have to give your real name and address because you're only ever allowed to be a member of the committee once. Once you've been on there, you can't be on it again. And they want real names and addresses because they want the real people to come, not their, they don't want them to come in character, they want them to come as real people. But that means that if you want to keep your name and address secret, you can't get on the committee, which is unfair to you because it means there's an aspect of the game that's not open to you. But would that be allowed or not allowed? Should it? What if guild leaders demand that you tell them who you are in real life? Many guilds will demand you sign up to their website and then you've got to give an email address. 
So context plays a big part here and consent plays a big part here. And they always need to be taken into account. There's no straight answer. Um, human rights lo uh, laws aren't necessarily geared to handle this multiple levels of subtle frames. They see things as ha either happening or not, but they don't see things as happening and, but protected because it's a game, but not protected because it's a sub-game, but protected because of um, it wasn't warned in advance or whatever. Right, next up is uh, MMOs. At this point here, if anybody's asleep and wants to wake up and leave, then you can do so, although if you are asleep, then you aren't going to hear me. Uh, anybody want to wander off? It's, it's fine, I'll close my eyes, I'll go off, yeah? No? Right, anyway, so next we're getting on to MMOs um, or virtual worlds. Um, these have all the issues I've described so far and many, many more. Um, when it comes to human rights and computer games, this is where all the action is. Uh, they're played by unmanageably large numbers of players. When I say unmanageably large, what I mean is that in a game of four players, if one of them breaks the rules, you can kick them out. But in a game of 40,000 players, it's very hard to kick somebody out because the other players can't kick you out. They can in a, in a four-player game, but they can't kick you out in a 40,000 player game. And players play for many different reasons. Not all of these reasons are legitimate. Some of them are, but some of them aren't. Um, MMOs are my own specialist field because I co-wrote the first one, so I know more about them than you. This is Scunthorpe, a scenic um, steel-making town in, uh, in Lincolnshire in England. Yes. Right. Um, when it comes to MMOs, the place to start is Raf Costa, who uh, he's the guy who did Ultima Online Star Wars Galaxies. Um, he had a thought experiment called Rights of the Avatar. And in this thought experiment, he thought, what if avatars, or characters, had rights? Not the players, the avatars. So he took the US Bill of Rights and France's Declaration of the Rights of Man, and he redrafted them in terms of avatars. And you can look it up on his website. Now, actually, avatars have no rights. Um, what Raff was doing was using the thought experiment to see what rights players had. So this is an um, often misunderstood paper. Oh, scary kid. Because a lot of people will read the title, Rights of the Avatar, and think it's arguing in terms of it, for the rights of avatars. It's actually arguing for rights of players. Um, he wrote this paper, and he put it out onto MudDev, which is where all the cool kids hung, used to hang out. Um, where all, everybody who was anything to do with them, um, that can't be mine because I switched it off. Yeah. Mm. Um, anyway, he, he released it into the wild and everybody attacked it. People hated it. They said, no way are we going to do our, our games running on those principles. That's awful. You've made a big mistake. So um, he went back and he recouched it. Instead of saying, this is what you have to do, he said, this is advice to admins. So this is advice to, the, to developers, the people who are running the games. And this is what it, uh, as a summary. So he said, somebody's finger is on the power button. Somebody controls that, the server. Somebody controls the game. What that somebody says goes. So they rule by fiat. Anything that they say can happen, happens. If this somebody doesn't provide a, con a code of conduct, their players deserve all they get. So you're playing a game, there's no code of conduct, the player, and they suddenly ban you for no reason. Well, they didn't have a code of conduct. You should have expected something awful to happen. Players should be consulted over changes to the code of conduct, but can be ignored. So uh, I'll listen to what you say, but um, and I'm only going to incorporate it if, uh, if I like it. And codes of conduct should be fair and applied fairly. So that sounds much more reasonable. Um, and it was accepted as being much more reasonable. 
what this means in terms of the actual rights of players is players have rights in the real world because they're humans in the real world an MMO is part of the real world it isn't somehow separate in a different dimension it is part of the real world but in considering rights they should only be thought of in terms of their real world context so in terms of the players not the characters so if a character gets murdered that's not real murder developers can take their ball home if they like this is like when you're a child and you've got the football and you're playing football you want to go home it's your ball you take your ball home nobody else can play they can't say we'll keep playing with your ball no it's mine with MMOs it's mine if I want to switch it off I can it's my MMO players don't have to play ball if they don't want to so they're playing the MMO if they don't like it well they'll just go and play someone else's MMO so what you can summarize player rights as is if you don't like it leave and this is the basis upon which MMOs have functioned always if you don't like it leave the people who control it can do whatever they like but if they do it too much then the people will leave and so they'll regret having done it so they want to try and attract them to it so they'll try and be nice but if they make it too nice the game won't be fun and they'll still leave but what if they can't leave as I mentioned earlier people can be addicted you, know, you addicted me to your game um, you have to accept your responsibilities well actually tough luck freedom of expression comes in here and it protects developers if you think about it in terms of books JK Rowling wrote seven books for Harry Potter if she wrote an eighth book and killed off Harry Potter doesn't matter how addicted you are to it she can she can do that she won't because she loves him which is a shame because I loathe the little guy uh, but um, but she can so she can kill Harry Potter and just because you're addicted to him you can't stop her from doing that if I'm playing an MMO and you're addicted to it I can switch it off doesn't matter you can't make me switch it back on um, but it isn't quite this simple let's say as a developer I know that there's a particular guy who's going to be really really upset if his character dies and I kill that character deliberately to make him really really upset well that would be wrong it might drive him to suicide that would definitely be wrong and I can't say just a game you know I've got freedom of expression I can do that because what I did using my freedom of expression killed somebody effectively so there are limits to what you can do you can also um, have problems if you change the context unexpectedly so if you're reading a Harry Potter book and you're expecting it to be like the previous Harry Potter books and suddenly Harry sits around smokes a load of dope and then goes off and uh, has sex with Hermione or the other way around um, well you might think you know I wasn't expecting this when I bought this book I was expecting it to be a load of drivel like the previous books I wasn't expecting it to be a racy exciting um, sex book um, no um, you, more to the point people who are buying it expecting it to be about for a book for little kids might be surprised to find it had x-rated content in it but if the book's cover warned you that it had x-rated content then that would be okay doesn't matter that everybody's been grown up thinking Harry Potter's this adorable weedy snivelling little uh, worm of a underdeveloped character um, doesn't matter um, I've got to hope JK Rowling doesn't see this because she'd probably object freedom of expression I'm okay um, so if, if you if you buy a book and expect it to be about this and it suddenly turns out to be about something way way out of the, the what you're expecting what, it, what it's advertising as being then you've got a problem that that book's breaking it likewise with games if I buy a game and I'm expecting it to be um, a simple platformer and it involves some kind of awful sadism well I need to be told that um, I'll come back to that again a bit later as well now MMO operators consider 
that their virtual worlds are private spaces. So I own, this is all, this is my land that you are visiting. But they're open to anybody with a computer. Now many of the rights in humanitarian law and international human rights law concern the relationship between the individual and the state. So things like rights to representation, rights to a fair trial. So in the real world, if I commit a crime, I, I get a fair trial and then they decide what's happened. But in an MMO, that might not happen. They might just ban me and I get no trial. I don't even get a right to a trial. That's not right. So if an MMO acts like a state, shouldn't it have the responsibilities of a state? World of Warcraft's got a larger population than 150 or so countries, depending on when you look at its population, but roughly that. So if it's got more people playing it than some countries have real people in it, shouldn't it stand up to its responsibilities and say, OK, we are in effect a state, therefore we should give people fair trials and do all the other things that states do. So there is an issue here because virtual world developers will routinely do things like this. They'll punish players without trial. So they'll just take points off them or something. They will exile them, ban them, restrict freedom of expression. They'll stop you from saying things that um, you, you were saying. They'll stop you from swearing on chat or whatever. They will destroy property. Um, you, your uh, virtual sword fell to bits through too much use. They'll infringe your privacy. They, may, they will look at what you were doing. So when you were having sex in that room, you know, um, text sex, then uh, that's, that will be attacked by their data miners. They may be sending you advertisements based on that. There's all sorts of things that they do. All of these here are human rights violations if they were done by a state. So should governments behave that way? Well, no, governments shouldn't behave that way. But MMO operators are not governments. They rule their virtual worlds, but they don't rule them as the governments. They rule them as gods. So they're gods, not governments. The difference is, gods work by changing the rules of physics. Whereas governments work by applying the laws of physics of their reality in order to um, get their, um, their way. So let's see, um, a god could say, oh, I can't be bothered to uh, walk all the way around there. I'm just going to walk through that glass window and I'll just change the laws of physics and I can do that. doesn't matter how much a government says it is, it is legal to walk through glass windows, you won't be able to walk through the glass window. Likewise, if you offend the god, a god can say, I'm sorry, you're going to hell. And you don't get to appeal, you're going to go to hell. Whereas a government can't send you to hell, but what a government can do is um, imprison you because they've, although they can't change physics, they've got control of the army and the army can come along and, and make you do things whether you want to or not you know, and cart you away and put you into prison. So the difference is that God can change the physics and it doesn't matter, if it, even if you want to be a government, if you can change the physics, you're a god like it or not. So all those violations that are going on, which would apply if they were governments, don't apply because they're gods and they can't not be gods. They control their realities. Now, unlike reality, it's easy to switch an MMO. So if I think this, is, this reality sucks, I don't like this reality, I'm going to go and play another reality where I'm a king. Well, I can't because I, I can, I'm stuck in this reality. But in an MMO, you can say, I don't like this MMO, it sucks, I'm going to go and play another one where I'm level 50. Then you can. So you can change realities. Um, so what it happens is it really does come down to, if you don't like it, don't play. If you're playing a game and you don't like what the gods are doing, well, then don't, don't play it. Go and play one where you do like what the gods are doing. Um, Designers can create an oppressive world, an unfair world. They can do whatever they like. 
because you don't have to play. If I wanted to create a game that was to do with um, escaping from Kolitz, that prisoner of war camp I showed you, well, I should be able to, shouldn't I? So, um, if I was playing a, such a game and I had a pair of wire snippers so I could snip through the wires to escape, I would expect that if one of the non-player character prison guards came along and saw me with the wire clippers, they would take them away. I would expect that. That's, you'd expect that as part of the game. But that would be a, right to, a violation of my right to property under human rights legislation. And so I should be able to say, I'm sorry, guard, I paid 30 cents for these over the internet. They're mine, you can't have them. Which means that I wouldn't even be able to create a game in which legitimate theft by the organisers was allowed by the player characters. But surely it must be allowed. You must be allowed, able to create games as miserable as you want, so long as people are, who sign up to the, play the games know what's happening and they know what's in store for them. And they know that, yes, I could lose something here as part of the game, as long as it's part of the game. Now, players, as well as designers, have the right to self-expression. So players are allowed to say things in game worlds to express themselves. Sometimes they do so in ways that the designers don't want them to. For example, ganking newbies. So a new player comes into the game immediately killed by an experienced player. Well, that's bad for the game because you don't get any new players, so the game eventually dies off. But it's fun for the one who's killing off these people as soon as they enter. So they've got a freedom of expression. Hey, yes, this is just this thing I do. You know, I just, it's my thing, I kill newbies. But that interferes with the, the, the designer's expression. Well, I, I, I created this game for lots of people and I don't really want you to do that. Whose rights of self-expression win? Well, the designers win under the it's my ball rule. They can say, look, it's my game. I don't want you to play, so you're not playing. This means that one designer can rule a game, make decisions against the will of a million players. Does that make sense? One designer's decision, I want my game to be like this, and you million people playing it don't want it to be like this, well, don't play if you don't like it. Does that make sense? Well, it may seem odd to give um, precedence to designer-created content, um, because doesn't freedom of expression mean that players should be able to play however they like within the game rules? Um, and in theory, yes. But what happens is their freedom of expressions overlap. So your freedom of expression stops me from playing the game how I like it. This is a, a mistake you see so, so many times. People talk about the players as if the players were a single entity with one opinion. It's not. The players are wide and varied. They've got lots of different opinions, lots of different skills, views, beliefs. They're not a single entity. And if you say the players want, you, the, you don't know that. The players don't want that. Some representatives or some loud speakers of the players may want that. But, you've, but almost certainly not every player will want that. The designer's expression is what all the players signed up to accept. So... We don't know what everybody likes, but we do know that when they signed up to the game, they, they signed up to accept what the designer was giving them. Therefore, what the designer is giving them is what's important here, not what an individual player thinks. So we refer to the designer's decision because that's what everybody's signed up for. That's the minimum criterion. Um, in single player games, all the rules are programmed into them um, as part of the physics. So if you're playing chess against the computer, you can't take the opponent's uh, kings on the first move because it won't let you. The, the physics don't let you do that. They only make you make the legal moves. Massively multiplayer games has, have lots of rules that aren't coded in. So they've got other rules, rules of behaviour and so on, which you can't code in. You can try to, 
um, but, but you can't. Um, for example, I showed you that town Scunthorpe. In America, um, America Online, people were playing, signing up to play, you know, to whatever. And when it said where you come from, they said they came from Scunthorpe and it wouldn't let them in. Well, why, why wouldn't it let us in? And the answer is because Scunthorpe hit their profanity detector. So he said, I'm sorry, you can't come in because you're, the town you live in contains a swear word, one of the worst swear words in English. So they had to say they came from Scanthorpe. And then they, they complained and complained and complained until eventually America Online said, OK, we do look rather stupid here. So we're going to let you, of all the words, we're going to let Scunthorpe be allowed. And as soon as they did, players start, um, or users of AOL started calling each other, you Scunthorpe. They used it as a swear word. So it doesn't matter what you do, players will find profanities. They will, they will invent words to be rude. There's a famous example of a Norwegian professor um, who decided that Norwegian, being a fairly modern uh, language, didn't have enough swear words in it. So he invented one. But rather than invent an artificial one, he just used the Norwegian word for umbrella, whatever that is. And so he started using the word umbrella like it was a swear word. And, um, and after a while, all his friends and everything knew that when he said, what the umbrella in hell is going on here? And then he'd go into a restaurant with them and say, um, can I leave my umbrella somewhere? And his friend would go, <gasps> because he trained them to think it was a swear word. And he actually meant an umbrella. So, but the point is you can, you can use anything as a swear word just by repeating it as a swear word. You, you watch TV programs and use words like frick and frack and stuff when we all know what they mean. Um, but they invent these words in order to use them as if they were swear words, but they're not. Um, now, if you've, if you've got an MMO and you want to stop people from swearing, you cannot because they will always create new swear words. That's an, an example of how the phys having control of the physics can't stop you from controlling what players are doing. The only way you could do it is to stop them communicating at all, and then they wouldn't play your game. Some players will only play by the coded in rules. They will ignore the unwritten rules. Um, these players can be problematic. Sometimes they're not, but most often they are, because they, they break the written rules. And sometimes they do so deliberately. Sometimes there's examples of them having done so deliberately in order to write an academic paper about it afterwards. Um, I have discovered that if I act like a jerk, people treat me badly. Hmm, yes. Um, if you um, say to people who are breaking the unwritten laws or the terms of service, because they are sort of written, it's just they're not coded in. If you say that they're um, breaking them, then they'll say, well, we're not doing anything wrong. We're just playing differently. This is how we want to play. So it's essentially a freedom of, of expression defense. But what if my fun depends on your moderating that expression? We've all signed up to this game so we can pretend that we are medieval warriors and you're coming in and spoiling it by not being a medieval warrior. This is a game for people who want to be medieval warriors. If you don't want to be a medieval warrior, go play something else. Well, I don't want to be a medieval warrior, but I do want to annoy people who are medieval warriors. That's how it works. It's very difficult to, to get rid of people like that because you can't code in, act like a medieval warrior. Do I have a freedom not to have to listen to your expression? If you're playing a Three Musketeers role-playing game and then somebody comes in and starts talking about the World Cup, that's broken it. You're not, talk, you're not Three Musketeers anymore, are you? Come here, D'Artagnan. Did you see that goal that Lampard got disallowed? Should have been 4-2, not 4-1. German. Uh, anyway. So you, you did to spoil it, and, and it's very difficult to throw people out of an MMO for breaking unwritten rules. Gold farming, for example, is an industry in which people play MMOs to collect in-world currency they send, sell for real money. So they're not actually playing for fun, they're playing professionally. Um, this means that players can buy success, 
a lot of players regard this as being unfair. They, they think, um, why should you be able to buy, um, buy extra levels? That's like saying, I'm not very good at the marathon. Is it okay if I buy like an extra kilometer so I start a kilometer ahead of everybody else? Well, no, it's not that. It's not actually good. They wouldn't let you start five centimeters ahead of anybody else, no matter how much you paid. And it's like this for MMOs. Oh, I'm just going to be buying this gold here because I just have to play for another two days to have enough gold to buy the, you know, the mount that I want to ride thing. Well, play those two days then because you might not be able to. Just paying real money for it. So it's regarded by most of the traditional players, at least in the pre-free-to-play days, as um, being unfair. But if somebody buys something um, in the game and, and you complain about it, they're just going to say, well, if you don't like it, don't play. You know, look, I, wanna, I wanted that super fast horse. I paid for it. If you don't like it, don't play. But the problem is that no matter where you go, that guy can follow. So let's say that um, you're um, Bill Gates and you think, right, I've had enough of you guys. I'm going to go off and set up my own MMO. I'm going to throw billions at it, make an MMO which is perfect. And you make this perfect MMO and everybody in there is, is role playing. It's fantastic. It feels a wonderful atmosphere. And then the gold farmer c guy comes in and says, who wants to buy some of my gold for real money? And if you say, get, get the hell out of here, then he says, well, if you don't like it, don't play. I didn't like it. I didn't play. I set up my old game and you still came. It's very difficult to get rid of people like that on that basis. You, you really do have to kick them out. Um, so this brings us to another important issue. This is property rights. Now, this is huge in MMO law. I'm only going to mention some things here. I'm not going to go into any detail. Um, I could give another hour and a half, two hours lecture about this. Um, the thing is that uh, under Article 17.2 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it says no one should be arbitrarily deprived of their property. So you can take people's property, for example, you can confiscate it if it's a danger or against the law or something, but you can't just take their stuff. Um, in 2010, a couple of years ago, a ship in EVE Online was attacked and it was destroyed. On that ship was its cargo. 74 pilot license extensions worth, worth as in it cost to somebody to buy these, $1,295. Somebody's bought these things here, traded them to this guy on the ship. The guy's ship gets blown up. He's lost, or well, she's lost, nearly $1,300. Was that arbitrary? Somebody just took it away just like that. They didn't even know they had it. They just shot them. Was it property? Those are pilot license extensions. What they mean is that um, you don't have to pay your, your subscription for another 74 months. Um, so that's what they, they mean. But is that property? It's, um, these are things which are, are hard to um, let's see, hard to bit. These are things which haven't been tested in courts. Um, this is an object from a World of Warcraft quest, a neural needler. This is from the Wrath of the Lich King expansion, the one before the one that's just come out. Um, back to property. Um, the biggest question about property is whose is it? Who actually owns something? Um, the developers will assert that everything in the MMO is their property. That's if they admit that it's property at all. Because it's really just bits in a database. But if players treat it as if it were regular pop property, they may feel that it's theirs. Especially if they've paid real money. It happens all the time in Second Life. You go into Second Life, you buy a whole load of this fancy gear and hoochie hair and stuff. It's yours. You paid for it. You own it. You can't say it belongs to Linden Labs because they never paid for it. You paid for it. But what happens if the game allows people to steal property? That would be okay, would it? In that Escape from Colditz game, you expect your property to be, to be stolen. That's all right. In other games, the very first virtual world, Mud, the one I wrote, co-wrote, 
that had a steal command, steal object from player, because that's something that could happen in the real world, it could happen in the game. Of course, if somebody did steal your stuff, you'd probably um, attack them, but you could do that in there. And yet, if, if it actually belongs to the real player, then they could demand it back under real world laws, surely. Um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 22.7, see I have looked at it, um, talks about the right to protection of moral interests in your artistic creations. Um, the, the Berne Convention that covers this is rights of attribution and integrity. Not all countries are signed up to this. The main one that isn't is America. But what it means is if I create a work of art and you publish a screenshot of it, I can insist you remove the screenshot because it's my work of art and you don't have my permission to display that screenshot. Um, we see this many times. Museums will put um, works of art on the website, but they won't let you use those works of art in your, um, on your own website. Uh, Wikipedia has got a big thing going on with the British Museum at the moment, or the National Gallery in Britain, um, where it's just plundered every image off the National Gallery saying these are images of non-copyright materials, so you don't own the copyright in the image because the image is of something that you don't own the copyright of. So there's a big fuss there, but other examples would be things like photo libraries. So if you want to photograph of, I don't know, um, some temple in Korea, either you go to Korea and take a photograph or you buy a photograph of it from a photo laboratory. But you can't just say, ah, oh, there's a photo, a photo site there, I really like their picture, I'm going to use it, because that's somebody's job is taking photos of these things and they want paying for that. And so they can, they can ask, they can insist that whatever you've um, done is removed. You sometimes hear of it when um, politicians choose some song to um, emphasise um, what they're doing and the people who recorded the song don't like the politicians. They can say, look, you're using my song out of context. You're using it um, to say something it's not saying, you're um, attempting to repurpose its, uh, its message for the wrong uh, reasons, you have to remove it. And under human rights law, they do, you do have to remove it. But if I can say any screenshot of mine that you put on your website has got to be removed, well, the virtual world itself is streaming screenshots the whole time. Can they just say, let's just remove, you know, I've, I've created this object in um, Second Life, but I don't want it to go on anybody's screens because it's so beautiful. Um, they, if they want to see it, they have to pay me. Well, that doesn't make any sense, surely. And yet, if you were to apply the letter of human rights legislation, it would. And they would be obliged to make changes to the programme. Uh, there's a lot more to do with virtual property, some of which does impinge on human rights. I'm not going to go into the details because it is even more boring than the rest of this lecture. But things to look into if you're particularly keen are nerfing virtual property. I buy a sword, there's only one of it, it cost me $3,000. Tomorrow you make 5,000 swords, it's now worth $2. Sh should I get compensation? Um, closure of failed MMOs in which people own virtual property. If you own stocks and shares on a stock exchange and the stock exchange closes down, well, it doesn't close down. What happens is that the government keeps it open so that you can sell your stuff to somebody, to people on a different stock exchange. If I own a, uh, an MMO and I've got all my stuff in there and they close the MMO down, uh, well, can they close it down? They've just deprived me of this $250,000 worth of inventory I had, which has happened in the past. Not to me, I don't have that much money, but um, to companies that have been essentially gold farmers that have um, had the servers they were working on closed down. They've lost all that money. Sometimes if you enforce a property right, that can destroy the property's value. So if the only reason, let's see, um, 
in um, Napoleonic times, armies carried flags, their colours. And if you captured an opponent's flag, their, their colours, then that was m tremendous prestige for you and shame for the people who'd, who you captured it from. But if you, uh, the only reason these are worth anything then is because you've managed to stop people taking them. So if the law stopped you from taking them, so I go in there and I take your flag and now I have to hand it back because real world lawyers are making me, well suddenly the flags aren't worth anything. They're only worth something because it's possible to steal them and they haven't been stolen. If it's impossible to steal them, then they've got no value. So the effect of enforcing a property right can destroy its value. There's also um, sales versus service of virtual property. The thing there is, um, am I actually buying the sword from you or am I paying you to transfer the sword from your character's inventory to my character's inventory? The latter is a service, the former is a property thing. If you go the service thing, then the property, it all owns to the uh, virtual world developer. Um, but if you go the other way, um, the property rights are the players. And so there is a big difference there. Anyway, now what I'm going to go through of this next slide is contradicting something that I've said many times earlier in this um, talk. See, the reason people play MMOs is to be and become themselves. Um, the benefit, the, the reason you're playing, the benefit you're getting is because it's a search for identity. You get to be who you really are by pretending to be somebody you're not. That's another two-hour lecture. Well, actually, it's three hours, that one, if you ever want me to explain it. But the aim is for you and your character to become as one, which we call immersion. Um, you're just going to have to take my word for it, but immersion is when, you, uh, have, when you've played an MMO for so long that your character is you. It's your means of projecting yourself into the virtual world. Now, what's scary about this is that when you're immersed, you and your character are not different. Your character is actually you. It's not a token that's representing you. It's not like a puppet that you're controlling. It's you, because that's the whole point of being immersed. You feel that you're in the virtual world, that that is you. Which means that if they are, in the player's mind, one, then what you do to the character you do do to the player. It doesn't mean if you kill the character, you kill the player. It does mean that if you hurt the character emotionally, you're hurting the player emotionally. So there's a whole frame that's removed from this equation. So if I'm playing a, an educational game in which I'm a surf and I get treated badly, this is just like normally, okay, so I'm playing a surf and I get treated badly. I've learned that masters used to treat their surfs badly. But if I'm immersed, then I will actually feel really bad that I've been badly treated by this other player. I may hate them in real life for what they did in the game because in the game was to me at that moment real life. So there's no mediation, it's direct. And when this happens, all the many of the things I've been talking about earlier suddenly fall away. You really are applying to the player and not the character. So I'm not going to give you a, a case study, um, but before I give you it, I'm going to have to explain the, this, this thing called the Covenant, which I've alluded to earlier, but um, not yet. Um, oh, this is um, Wednesday Adams out of the Adams family, 1960s TV show. Um, right, so MMO design. If you're uh, designing a massively multiplayer online role-playing game, you as the designer set the fictional framework. So you, you, you're saying that this is the fiction in which this world takes place. You provide a, a set of possible actions. These are the things you can do. You cannot walk through walls, but you can walk through doors. So you've got the actions. Um, you give them a range of goals. These are the quests you've got to do. These are the reputation that you want to get higher, whatever. You give them the goals and you pre present events to the players such that they have to make a decision as to which goals they should pursue and how. So in combat they should be deciding which different um, spell to use at a particular moment, 
why and when and how and so on. Um, this is um, this means, motive, and opportunity. That's um, that's actually how they work in detective fiction. And uh, you know, police officers, if they find a murder, who had the means, the uh, motive, and the opportunity to do it? And spookily, MMO is actually the abbreviation for massive multiplayer games. Sometimes these things just come together. Um, the thing is, though, when you're playing an MMO, even though the, the, um, this is all the designer's doing, the designer can't tell you up front exactly what you're going to have to do. Because finding out is part of the fun. You, when you play an MMO, learning the game, exploring the world, this is all part of the fun. Finding out what the story is, is part of the fun. If they just tell you, look, if you play this game, you're going to learn out that this guy here um, started out good and turned bad, and then, <coughs> then murdered his family and so on. Well, now I don't need to play the game, do I? You've just spoiled it. So the designers want to tell you um, the kind of things that you're going to come across, but without going into detail, because that would spoil it for you. So... If you don't know what a game fully involves, how do you know you're going to like it? And if you don't know if you're going to like it, why would you play it? So what designers have to do then is to create a general set of expectations of where the boundaries lie. So they're going to say, it's going to, the boundaries are going to be within this kind of gameplay. It's going to be this kind of gameplay. It's going to involve a lot of button mashing or something. Uh, the genre. This is a game about werewolves and vampires. If you play this game, you will not find undersea monsters, just werewolves and vampires. Um, morality. This is a game in which there's a, um, a grey line between good and evil. You may be having to do some bad things, you may be having to do some good things. It's up to you which side of the line you fall on. So they, they tell you these where the boundaries, roughly where the boundaries lie. And they covenant, which is a word meaning promise, to players that even though the players don't know what's coming up it will fall within those boundaries so they're making a promise to the players look this is a game about the wild west i'm not saying any more than that but if it's not about the wild west then you can sue us so if you're told up front that you're playing a game and it's about knitting you can't complain if that game features a lot of knitting. It's not going to be a problem. But you can complain if it involves stabbing people to death with knitting needles because you'd have expected that to be of told you up front. You know, if it's a game about knitting that implies certain things and one of which is it's not a game about killing people with knitting needles. If it is then you should have told people about that. Now MMOs are ongoing projects um, they go on for years, sometimes decades. Um, there are still people playing my, my g game Mud 2, which they have been doing since 1985. So over 20 years, nearly 30. Um, designers sometimes want to change the boundaries. Um, if you want to change the boundaries, you have to explain to the players outside of the context. So for example, Star Wars Galaxies was losing players. About 60% of its players were um, crafters. They liked making things. About 40% of the players were um, combat people. The crafters were all making things for the combat people. Now the game needed to be stabilised. It was losing players. So that if they could focus um, by trying to give all the combat players something to do or all the crafters something to do. If they went for all the crafters, the combat people would stop playing. If they went for the combat, the crafters would stop playing. They went for the combat. So even though only 40% of the players were combat, the reason they went for that is because you don't need the, com the, the crafters to make a, com a good combat game. If they'd gone with the crafters, then the crafters would be making stuff for nobody because all the, com the combat would have been taken out. So they threw away 60% of their user base in order to make essentially a massively multiplayer first-person shooter. And it worked. It's, um, it lost 60% of their players straight away, but the remaining ones stabilised and the game's still going. If they hadn't have done it, it would have just gone down to nothing. 
So they had to explain to their players that they were going to do this. The new game enhancements were announced. Um, people didn't like it. They left. But not everybody left and it still kept going. So they just they said that, but they said it outside the game. They didn't say it within the game because it wouldn't have made sense in a game context. Now this is fair enough. I've got no problems with this. Um, designers can also break the content, con covenant within the game legitimately. So the game says that this isn't going to happen, but I'm going to make it happen within the game. Um, for example, I can overstep a boundary in order to establish it. Um, there's an example, um, I don't know if it's still in WoW now, but um, it certainly was um, when in 2004 when I played through this bit. But um, there was a quest called Zen's Bidding, um, where there's this guy, he's a satyr you know, with the horns and things, and um, he asks you to go and kill some things you know you really probably shouldn't kill. So you go off and kill them, and then you have to do another quest as penitence to atone for it. You sh you've killed those things you shouldn't have done, now you have to do this other quest. So you're asked to do something morally wrong in order to be told this is morally wrong. You won't be asked to do anything like this again. So it establishes the boundary. There's another um, example. Um, this is from the Wrath of the Lich King expansion. Army of the Damned. Here, for a, in, in like a dream sequence, you get to role play the bad guy. And you get to kill all these players, not, not players, non-player characters. And the reason you do that is to show just how bad he is. So you're stepping over the boundary to find out how bad the bad guy is. So when you step back, you know how bad he is and what a problem it's going to be trying to kill him because he can do all this. Resurrect all these um, people he's just killed to try and kill you. So you can step over a boundary in order to establish it or in order to make a point about the bad guys or something like that. Now, there's a quest in World of Warcraft called The Art of Persuasion. This, is, this was from the Wrath of the Leech King expansion, in which you are asked to torture a prisoner for information. Using that neural needler device I showed you a bit earlier. It's a device that causes excruciating pain without actually causing any long-term damage. Now, as an Alliance player, which I am, I suppose you're all Horde, because you think that's cooler. Yeah, right. Um, it's not something you've ever been asked to do before. The Alliance pretty well plays along with the Geneva Convention. So you're asked to torture, and you've never tortured anybody before. And why are you suddenly being asked to torture this guy? Um, and to make it worse, the people who are asking you to do the torturing, the Kirin Tor, um, are themselves forbidden from torturing. So, hey, we're not allowed to torture people, but here, take this pain stick and zap that guy with it. I'll just be over here looking at these books. So they're kind of you know, morally dubious there. Now, most players just did it. Okay, what do I have to do? It's step 11 out of 15. Poke the guy with the pain stick, bang, bang, bang. Okay, now what do I have to do? And now I have to go off. So they just ignored it. But a significant number of them, players were dismayed. And I was one of them. And I blogged about it. And I got a thousand emails on the subject about it. Some of them from sane people. Um, okay, now there are several explanations as to why you could put a torture quest suddenly in World of Warcraft for people who aren't expecting it. The first one is it could be an artistic statement. So it could be showing how just one small incremental stepping over the line, um, one amoral action leads ultimately to decay. See, in this particular expansion, the bad guy called Arthas um, made such a descent. He started off good, but in order to achieve his end, he kept having to do these things that were slightly bad um, until he started doing things like uh, burning his ships so that his men couldn't go back home. Um, other things like um, destroying, killing everybody in a, in a town um, in case they were, they'd been infected by um, the undead stuff. Uh, 
So he kept doing these things that got worse and worse until eventually um, he'd been corrupted by it all. And this quest, you could say, gives the player an insight into how a good person, by making one minor thing, if you do enough of those, eventually you become a bad person. But the thing is, if you do that, you have to say you've done it. Um, because otherwise the players won't notice. Most of the players just did that, they didn't even notice. If there had been something afterwards where maybe the torturer gave the wrong advice, uh, said that there's, um, something had happened, uh, the, the information they gave was false, and then you'd have had to come back and then there had been consequences, okay, then that would have been a, a way of flagging it up. But if you don't say that um, this is why, that um, this is just like what happened to Arthas, then either the players won't notice or they will notice and they'll think you, the designer, are a jerk because you've just, you've, you've, you've uh, done it without, um, without flagging it. Um, there's another poss ex possible explanation. Um, this could be that it's a political statement um, about the analogy between we don't do torture and the US government. See, the Kirin Tor don't do torture, but they give their prisoners to people who do do torture. You in the game. And um, the US government doesn't do torture. So using a process they called extraordinary rendition, they gave it to some of their Middle Eastern allies who did do torture. So that's like saying, oh, we don't do torture. We just give you to the people who do do torture, um, which is bad. Now, if you're doing it in the game as a way of um, making a political point and saying, OK, this is just like the US government's thing, and these Kirin Tor, they're, um, they're hypocrites, that's fine, but you have to flag it up. You have to, there has to be some consequence of their being hypocrites. But there isn't any consequence. It just carries on as if nothing had happened. So this is a valid thing, but you have to flag it up, because if you don't flag it up, they either won't notice or they'll think you're a jerk. Another explanation is that this was um, an expansion where there were um, a lot of the players who'd started had got a few years older, so maybe they were wanting um, to incorporate edgy, edgier material because the game was getting more mature, because the players who'd been 17 in 2004 were, whatever, 20-something you know, when, when this came out. Um, again, this is justifiable, but you have to tell people about the changes up front. You have to say, this new expansion is a bit more edgier than the previous one with some material in it that's a bit darker than before. And the reason for that is so that if it bothers people, they can stop playing. Now, I didn't know when I bought the Wrath of the Lich King expansion that it would be asking me to torture non-player characters. But it did. So they never, they never said. They should have said. So they sh if they don't say, then they shouldn't do it. And then the fourth explanation is what usually applies to a quest. There's nothing gets flagged up. Nothing is marked as being special. And nothing's um, said we've, ex we've gone past these boundaries because the designer um, thinks that they're within the boundaries. So there's no need to flag this up. There's no need to say that this is anything in any way special because I'm not breaking the covenant. I think it's fine to torture people. Well, the designer was wrong. They were breaking the covenant. Alliance players weren't expecting that to happen. And if they paid any attention at all when they were reading the text, then it would have um, flagged something to them. Harry Potter 7, if you read it, um, there's an unflagged instance of torture there. He does something, I don't know what it's called, excrucio or something equally bad Latin, um, where he tortures somebody to make them tell him something using a spell to torch to, to that causes incredible pain that he's previously learnt on spiders. And there's no bad consequence of that, he just does it. So torture's great, is it, if you read Harry Potter? Did you notice that when you read Harry Potter? Or uh, I just watched the movie. Um, the Wrath of the Lich King expansion had some other quests that were a bit alarming for uh, players of good characters. One of them was called Tormenting the Soft Knuckles. In this one here, you needed to kill this um, female gorilla but she wouldn't come out unless you killed all her babies so he went along killing babies 
until she was so annoyed that she came out and then you killed her. Well, that's, that's a bit cruel, that. Um, that's not the sort of thing. Okay, not human because it's a gorilla, but nevertheless, killing things babies in order to try and lure it out is a bit disturbing for players. Another one it had was Surrender Not. This is a comedy quest. They've got these things, murlocs, that go off and they're these kind of fish creatures. And, and um, you need to, uh, there's some of them, and you need to kill the boss uh, uh, through all these murlocs. So you, uh, you get this uh, murloc suit and a white flag. So you run through all the murlocs waving this white flag. They don't attack you because you're wearing a murloc suit and they think you're surrendering. And then you get to the end, but ha-ha, it was a ruse. This isn't a white flag. I didn't mean it at all. You throw it down, you take it off, and you kill the boss. Now, a white flag is supposed to be sacrosanct. If, if you use a white flag as a means of sneaking up and killing the enemy, that's as bad as if you, sh you shoot somebody carrying the white flag. If they're surrendered, then they have to surrender. And if you pretend that you're surrendering and you're not, that's an abuse of the white flag. You should not do that. And yet it was a comedy quest in World of Warcraft there. I should point out that these are the only three quests out of the whole of that expansion that were bad, and there were you know, hundreds of quests. It's not like I'm having to go at World of Warcraft here. I'm only mentioning it because it stood out because the other quests were sort of... Um, because they, the other quests were all fitted well. Um, some MMOs have troublesome quests that fit the context. Some of the things you're asked to do are dubious, but the MMO itself has been pitched in that area. So some of the things you're asked to do in um, The Secret World are um, less uh, wholesome than they might be. But you knew that when you played the game, it has a high uh, adult rating. People swear the whole time in the game, the, the non-player characters. So it, it does fit. And for these games, though, you'll know, usually know the deal before you play. You play the game, you know it's got this edgy material in it, so you can't complain when it happens. It's only that if it doesn't tell you, you that it's going to have it in it, and then it does, then you, then you can complain. Um, now, some players will cheerfully use their it's just a game art, um, thing to say there's nothing they wouldn't do for experience points. Yeah, I'll torture people, I don't care, just give me the experience points. It's just a game. But everybody's got something which will shock them out of their um, magic circle. So if they've got some particular um, bad idea of sexual assault, you know, involving carrots or something, um, to a representation of, let's say, they worship some kind of god, or if not, they've probably got a parent. And if the MMO showed that, oh, yeah, sure, I'll um, abuse my god, um, a, a depiction of my god just for some experience points, well, maybe they wouldn't, actually. If they, maybe they wouldn't um, go along and shoot all those bad guys who had their mother's face. You know, there are things that will shock pretty well anybody out of it. So you can't really use this as an excuse. Everybody has something, something that will shock you out of their immersion. And if, you, and if a human rights violation doesn't do it, well, either it's protected by some context or the players have a poor appreciation of human rights. When you exit the frame of the magic circle, you exit the game. So as soon as you're, the magic circle bursts, that's the end of the game. And you can be shocked out of that. Now, my own particular complaint here wasn't that um, I thought games shouldn't depict torture. I think it's fine within the context. Um, my problem was a design issue. The, um, uh, the, de the designer hadn't flagged it. So it was a game design issue. It wasn't a human rights issue. But... Some people were genuinely very distressed by the quest. They wouldn't have played that thing, that expansion, if they'd known that it involved torture. One of them claimed to uh, email me, claimed to have been tortured once in real life. Um, claimed is the word. I've got no reason to disbelieve them, but then I've got no reason to disbelieve the ones who said they were going to kill me. Um, I did get lots of uh, emails about this. Um, you can't say, well, if you don't like it, don't play if it's already too late. Yeah, if you don't like it, don't play, it works if you know there's going to be some, something like torture. It doesn't work if you didn't know and then it suddenly happens. It's too late then. Um, 
This is a final level of the cake, the futuristic one. This is just some questions here. There are some sorts of answers if you want to look at the artificial intelligence literature from the probably the 1980s. Can non-humans have human rights? Um, suppose I created an MMO with non-player characters that was so sophisticated that you couldn't distinguish them from real people. Okay, so it might take a few years. So how many do you want? Like 5,000? Would that be enough? 50,000? 500,000? We've got the rest of eternity. At some point, someone will create a virtual world that contains non-player characters who are as intelligent as we are right now. They may not even know that they're non-player characters. They may think that they're living in a reality. You could be a non-player character for some god's reality, for all you know. So they don't know they're artificial. Can you treat them inhumanely? Can you do things to them which, if they were humans, you wouldn't be allowed to do? What if that's the only reason they were created? I created this creature in order to experiment on them to find out how diseases work so I can cure real people in my reality. If I, so let's say I created an MMO and I spread disease through the MMO and from that I managed to cure humans of diseases. That would be great, but I may have killed billions of non-player characters. But those are billions who wouldn't even have existed if I hadn't have brought them into life in order to, to, to give them hideous diseases. Should I be allowed to do that? If I couldn't have hurt them, then they wouldn't have existed in the first place. I mean, this is one of the arguments, the, the, the vegetarian argument, which is um, if we didn't eat cows, we wouldn't have any cows. Um, I'm not saying it's an argument that makes any sense, but it's, um, uh, there would be far fewer cows in the world if, we didn't, if people didn't eat cows than if people do eat cows. So one of the defences for having cows is, well, let's let's keep them around because otherwise there wouldn't be any. We'd, you know, there'd just be a few in zoos. They don't roam wild. Um, okay, now in this talk I've talked a lot about human rights but none of them are heavyweight. Nobody is in prison without trial because of this. These are human rights viola violations but when it comes to the um, orders of magnitude, these are all at the bottom. None of them are anywhere near what the real meaty human rights legislations are meant to address. But there are many small abuses are happening daily to many, many people. So it's not like there are 50 people who are imprisoned without trial, uh, but there might be 50 million people who are routinely having their... Uh, um, human rights abused at minor levels. Which is the worst? Which, um, are they both the same? Are they comparable in any way? Well, you get to decide what your opinion is on these issues because very little of it is actually decided. That's one of the great things about this area is it's not really been examined in a lot of detail. This is probably the most detailed talk you'd come across on this. Um, is depicting human rights violations itself a human rights violation? Well, right now you know the answer is it depends on who you're depicting it to. Because if it's depicting it to someone who's immersed, then it could be possibly. Otherwise it maybe isn't, but it might affect people in the outside world. You know where to look for the answers. I'm not saying I know the answers. I'm just saying you've got a better position now from which to argue what you think the answer should be. So there are a few guiding principles to bear in mind when you're making your analysis, any analysis of this sort of thing. Always remember it's the players, not the characters, that have the rights. If the player is immersed, then they will have, the, the character will have the rights, but only the rights the player has. Murdering a character isn't murdering a player, but it might be some kind of emotional assault on a player. Players who consent temporarily <coughs> to give up a human right so as to gain a greater benefit, <coughs> sorry, my voice is running out, you'll be pleased to know, they won't like do good as interfering. So if people know that what they're, they're giving up some human right just for a short period in order to get a lot more fun or a greater understanding or something, 
then they won't like it if you interfere. Come along and say, you shouldn't really, you know, let's, let's release you from this prison. No, 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 I'm in this prison because I'm trying to uh, understand the, um, what it was like in the 17th century when people were accused of being witches or something. They won't like it if you come along and um, apply lo um, human rights laws without considering why the people have consented to give them up, their, their, their um, rights up. There's an implicit covenant between designers and players that affects rights. Designers are promising things and some of those promises affect human rights, the depiction of or the use of or the violation of. And if you know up front, that makes a difference to if you don't know up front. And frames in the magic circle are crucial. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is why I showed you the Wednesday Adams picture. It's all fun and games until someone loses an eye. Then it's just fun. So the game, the game stops when somebody loses the eye, but you can still have fun. But it's like when you're playing, if you're playing a game and somebody gets hurt, the game's over because uh, we're not playing a game now. Reality is intruded. When reality intrudes, it's like a dart hits a balloon, bang. The balloon can hold an awful lot, but if too much reality goes in, bursts it, you've lost the game. Um, it's possible that if you assert a right, um, a human right, it can be self-defeating. So let's say that you've got an MMO and somebody asserts their right to go into that MMO and preach a religion. The players will stop playing it. Eventually, the person who's in there to preach the religion will have nobody to preach to. So they will stop. The result is you've got an empty game. Letting somebody go in there and preach the religion has spoiled the game. The person hasn't got any more converts and the game's empty. So maybe you shouldn't let them go into the game to preach the religion in the first place because the end result in both cases is the, the, there's um, nobody, nobody's converted but the, uh, in, in one case but the game's still healthy and everyone's playing and the other one is the game's a, an, an empty rump of a game with hardly anybody in it. Ask why human rights exist before you mindlessly apply it and look for competing rights. And what I've said here applies to games, but it does apply to other things. Simulations, social worlds, uh, it's like Second Life. Non-games, it's always a good idea to look how non-games do things like books and movies when studying how games might do things. And you'd be pleased to know the final slide. There was an early text MMO called Mist. When I say early, it was like 1983. He used the MUD1 engine. And it was run by a tyrannical administrator. All the time, he would delete or imprison characters. So you logged in and your character was gone because he just killed it, because he could. He would destroy property. So you'd be in the middle of a fight and suddenly your sword would disappear. He just took it off you because he could. Um, he would ban players, he would insult players. Sometimes you'd give players billions of points. Well, actually, whatever, 2 to the power of 35 minus 1 is points. And, and then take them away to win. So you could be all-powerful and suddenly no-powerful. This was all done arbitrarily, all done on a whim. He never really had any reason for it. He just did it because he could. And the players loved it because it was part of the game. The whole point was that there was this crazy guy just doing rubbish to, the, to things and, and it kept the game alive and fresh and you didn't know what was going to happen. It was different from day to day. People loved it. And yet all of that breaches human rights legislation. Should a game like Mist be allowed? Well, surely the answer is, well, yeah, it should be allowed. But how does it fit in with what the human rights laws say. Right, well, I finally finished there, only um, two and a half hours. So uh, that's it. <laughs>